Welcome to the National GP Trainee Teaching, the National VTS, the second session. Um, we ran the first session uh, last month at the end of July, and this was after we'd been running nine lockdown learning webinars, where we were doing them throughout the lockdown uh, period, and people wanted us to continue something. So um, essentially, each time we're going to cover um, about three different topics. We'll do some AKT stuff, some consultation skills things, some things more generally to do with either GP training or GP careers, and there'll be a time and a chance for you to ask any questions about anything that you'd like to ask at the end. Okay, so for those joining for the first time, and I can see a few names, just a very brief introduction. My name is Dr. Mohibur Rahman. So I'm a portfolio GP. I do a range of clinical roles. So I'm a partner in my own practice. I work as a locum in various other NHS practices. Um, I work in community detox. I've got an interest in humanitarian medicine, and I practice specializing in sexual health. And I'm the medical director of eMedic, so I have a lot of educational roles. So um, I teach on behalf of ourselves, but also I've taught for Pulse. I've taught for RCGP Beds and Hearts. In fact, we did a course with the RCGP this weekend gone the MRCGP AKT Masterclass Half Day Revision um, and also for Health Education England, uh, East of England um, and various VTS schemes. Okay, um, so that's me. And in terms of the format, we're going to cover three different topics. It's very interactive, so you'll see there's the chat function. I will turn that off periodically when we're doing questions, but we'll use a poll function instead that you can use to answer questions. Um, following the questions, and then we'll do a sample case. There'll be rapid reviews of the relevant guidance so that you can be up to date, okay? So we're gonna start with some AKT revision. We'll do a few stats questions, admin questions, and clinical questions, five in total. Then I'm gonna to talk to you about some tips for home visiting, and we'll do a sample case, not to do with home visits, but just a sample consultations case. And then finally, I'm going to look at some really frequently asked questions that have been asked over the years by people in ST1, ST2, ST3. So hopefully relevant to all of you at some point in your training. OK, and then ask your own questions at the end. So let's go straight into some AKT revision questions. So we're going to do five questions. You'll have 55 seconds for each question. And then I'll use the poll. Um, if you don't see the poll, as I said, just write the answer down at home. OK, here we go. First question. So I can see that the most popular answer by a very large margin is D, about just over half of you picked D, but you can see it's a high challenge question because every single answer option has been picked. So, you know, the others are fairly evenly spread, but A and C, mephenamic acid, and then um, leave an adjustable releasing IUS. So things like the Mirena coil, for example, um, are about even, okay? The, the two that were less popular were tranexamic acid um, and then cyclical or north, north estrone, okay? So the correct answer, is D, allopurinol acetate, okay? Um, out of interest, if I open the chat, does anyone know the dose of allopurinol acetate that's used for treating people who've got menorrhagia and have fibroids, or that was being used? It's not anymore, that's why this is the correct answer. Just feel free to type that into the chat. Meanwhile, let me explain why this is the right answer. So something really important, doing well in the AKT is down to both knowledge, I, you've learned the material, you've learned the curriculum, and then technique. Someone could work really hard, learn their stuff, but if you don't read the question carefully, you don't manage your time, you miss certain keywords on the day of the exam, unfortunately, you can still lose marks and ultimately fail. So this is what we call a negatively framed question. The question's asking, which of these is the least suitable treatment option? So this is a lady who's got heavy menstrual bleeding, also known as menorrhagia, okay? And you can see from the history, she doesn't have any other high risk features. So she's got no dyspareunia. She hasn't got um, inter intermenstrual bleeding. Examination is normal, okay? So I, there's no red flags here that make us think of cancer. There's uh, nothing from the examination that makes us think of uh, you know, a specific diagnosis. So this looks like someone who might just have menorrhagia without any other obvious cause, okay? 
So the least suitable treatment, not the most suitable. Now, some of you that got this wrong, it may well be that you were just picking, okay, I know that we could use mifenamic acid to reduce you know, the heaviness of the bleeding or that tranexamic acid can also be used, okay? And so you might have picked one of these, not because of a lack of knowledge, but because of technique. The question's asking, which is the least suitable? Now, this used to be used up until very recently. This was in the guideline for women who had maybe small fibroids, and small fibroids might not show any examination findings, okay? And menorrhagia, allopurinol acetate at five milligrams once daily was one of the recommended treatments. This is not the same as ELA-1, the emergency contraception. That's a 30 milligram stat dose, okay? But the five milligram once daily low dose, it was a treatment for menorrhagia. But it's the least suitable, why? Because currently the license has been revoked because of uh, a, an MHRA, Medicines and Healthcare Regulations Agency uh, warning, okay? So let's look at management of menorrhagia. We can manage this in primary care if there's no obvious pathology identified, even if they've got fibroids, if they're smaller than three centimeters, or if we suspect or diagnose adenomyosis as the cause of menorrhagia. In these situations, first line management would be LNG IUS, so things like the Mirena coil, okay? Other options would be tranexamic acid or mefenamic acid. Both will help with reducing uh, bleeding and also a little bit with pain. And then combined hormonal contraception or cyclical oral progestogen like norethisterone, okay? All of those are okay. The least suitable, because it's not recommended anymore, is allopurinol acetate at five milligrams. The brand name for the five milligram dose is called Esmir. Okay, so this was recent alert, March 2020. The license was suspended because of a few cases of serious liver injury. And so the current guidance is don't start any women with menorrhagia who might have fibroids on allopurinol acetate. And if you've got a patient who's already on it, you should contact them and advise them to stop because of this risk. It does not affect, and there's no risk being seen with the allopurinol acetate 30 milligrams used for emergency contraception, LR1, because that's a one-off dose, okay? Now, the reason I wanted to bring this in is MHRA alerts have regularly featured in the exam as an area that you're expected to be up to date when important drugs are stopped being used, their license is revoked, or there's an alert out. And MHRA is a national alert about drug safety, okay? So there've been ones, for example, about yellow fever. There was one recently about benzodiazepines and opioids. There was one about uh, using quinolone, so things like ciprofloxacin, things like that. So it's an important area to look at, drug interactions. Right, let's look at another one. Okay, thank you very much. I'll stop it there. So I can see that the two most popular answers are A and F, so FBC and transvaginal ultrasound. After that, lots of people also picked transabdominal ultrasound. And then we had a few people picking things like um, hysteroscopy, um, uh, CA125. Nobody picked LFTs, just a, a few people picked uh, TFTs. Okay, now this is what we call a multiple best answer. Can you see it says which two of the following? would be most suitable investigations for this patient. A multiple best answer in the AKT, you have to get both parts right to get the one mark. If you get one right and one wrong, you won't get half a mark, you will get no marks. It's quite strict how it's marked. So that, that's something just to be aware of and to make sure you're familiar with this format. Okay, so the correct answers are A and F. So well done, you know, a good proportion of you pick both of those, okay? But there's quite a lot of people that got one of those, but then picked one of the others. Unfortunately, you wouldn't get any marks. So. <clears throat> One of the things we're going to think about is the fact that as well as being heavy, the periods are painful. And then abdominal examination is normal, but on bimanual pelvic examination, she's got a bulky uterus with tenderness. Okay, This fits with a possible adenomyosis as the cause of her 
heavy menstrual bleeding, her menorrhagia. Now, all ladies with menorrhagia, we want to do an FBC because we want to see how much have they bled? You know, has it led to anemia? Is it something significant? OK, so that is for everyone. OK, on examination, if you saw, for example, because, for example, if your TFTs are off, that can sometimes affect your periods. So, you know, if you saw something that's made you think specifically of thyroid disease, you might do that. LFTs are generally not a good indication for CA125. You might do if on examination you actually felt a mass, not just a bulky uterus, but a mass, and you thought maybe there's a risk of ovarian cancer. Okay. Um, in this particular case, if you think it's adenomyosis, transvaginal ultrasound is the recommended investigation rather than MRI or transabdominal ultrasound, uh, which we'd normally do for most women. Okay. Hysteroscopy is for patients where you're specifically thinking of uh, other diagnoses. So let's look at that now. Okay. So in terms of investigations that we might do, if we think that they might have submucosal fibroids, polyps, or just endometrial pathology, then they need to be referred for hysteroscopy. Okay, so some of the things in the history that are going to make you think of that. Having bleeding in between periods. And then if they've got additional risk factors for endometrial pathology. Okay, so you know they previously had history of endometriosis, had uh, other problems. Okay, if you suspect that they've got larger fibroids, then pelvic ultrasound, so transabdominal ultrasound, will be the investigation of choice. So examples of things that would make us think of that is that on abdominal palpation, the uterus is palpable. It wasn't for this lady. And then that you might either you know, feel a pelvic mass or examination inconclusive. A good example of that is sometimes if you've got a patient who is obese or morbidly obese, sometimes it might be difficult to do a bimanual examination and to sort of you know, decide and you're not sure, then you might send for a pelvic ultrasound is transabdominal. And then if you suspect adenomyosis and the things that are going to make you think about that are dysmenorrhea, so painful periods as well as heavy periods, and then a bulky tender uterus on bimanual palpation, just like in this patient, then transvaginal is the investigation of choice rather than MRI or transabdominal. So bulky uterus with tenderness on bimanual, but the abdominal examination was normal, and then painful periods as well as heavy. Do you see? Okay, so right now, when would we refer patients with heavy menstrual bleeding. So rather than, I talked about when we could manage it in primary care, which is a lot of the patients, but when would we refer them into secondary care? Type that into the um, chat. <clears throat> okay, let's see what people have put up. Okay, so someone said if they had weight loss, okay, great. So that's a red flag for a possible cancer. If you've got menorrhagia and weight loss, you might think there could be an underlying cancer. Um, if first line measures failed, so you tried tranexamic acid, mefenamic acid, um, you know, LNG, IUS, and it didn't work. If they had particularly large fibroids, okay, um, if uh, they're symptomatic from the anemia, so they've lost that much blood that, you know, uh, the anemia is causing a problem. Um, and so we think that things like, you know, they might need more urgent treatment. Um, if we don't know the cause, and so we need to investigate it further, if they need a hysteroscopy, so some of the things that we mentioned there, um, great, so absolutely, people have got most of them. So these are the times when we might want to refer on. Refer urgently if they've got ascites, because ascites, we should be thinking about possible cancer. Um, and, and or if there's a pelvic or abdominal mass that doesn't fit with the feeling of fibroids, something craggy, something really firm, something uh, that's in one place and, and sort of, you know, tethered. Refer under a two-week referral for suspected cancer if they've got a pelvic mass and then red flag features for cancer, like the ones you guys have mentioned. So weight loss, unexplained bleeding, okay? Or if they've got site-specific symptoms. So for example, ulceration on the vulva, okay? Uh, you know, ulceration in the vagina, um, if you see changes in the cervix that are worrying. And if they've got fibroids that are large, we think that they're likely to be three centimeters or more, then we'd consider specialist referral. Why? Because they need a hysteroscopy, but that's non-urgent because we're not thinking about cancer. We're just thinking about something benign, but may well cause symptoms and problems later. Okay, great. All right, we're gonna do a couple of statistics questions now.
Okay, so popular answers here were H and E. So practice H, practice E are the two most popular ones. After that, it was A. Okay, so the correct answer is H. So well done, about half, just under half of you got that right. So quite a lot of people struggled with this. Okay, so let's look at the question. So if you go to Public Health England, you can actually get data about practices and the percentage of broad spectrum antibiotics. So you can get data on things like cancer referrals, on demographics, you know, how many patients they have that are older, how many children they have on their list, um, benzodiazepine prescribing, mortality rates for different areas. So one of the metrics that they look at to compare quality of practices is general antibiotic prescribing. And then another one is of the antibiotics prescribed, the percentage that are broad spectrum antibiotics, so things like cephalosporins, colmoxiclav, and quinolones. Okay. So this is you know real data that you might get. Okay. And what we're seeing here is the patient list size. These are bigger practices, and this is the percentage that we're looking at. So the question is asking which has the lowest proportion of broad spectrum antibiotics. Now, the good thing about this, this is a data interpretation type question. There's been a lot more of this type of question where you don't actually need to do any calculations. You just need to be able to learn to interpret real life health data. So if you look at H, all you're doing is reading off here. H is about 3%. You can see it's the lowest one. E is after that. They're about 3.5%. G is just under 4%. You can see that you know, it's got to be one of these three, but this one is lower than this. So that's why it's here. OK, it's just over three percent, isn't it? H. OK, so practice H is the lowest. You don't need to do any calculation. You don't need a, you know, any formulae. It's just interpreting data. Let's do the next one. So popular answers here were A and B, practice A and practice B, okay? Practice A was the most popular by a huge margin. More than half of you picked practice A, okay? About 30% picked practice B. So the correct answer here is practice B, okay? The key thing here is this key word here. It says, which practice has rates that are statistically significantly higher than expected, okay? So if it asks which has the highest proportion of broad spectrum antibiotic prescribing, it would be practice A at 6%. But you can see here, practice A is a tiny practice, okay? So 6%, remember this is percentage of broad spectrum antibiotics. They might only have prescribed antibiotics to 10% of patients in a year. So if you've only got 300 patients that you've prescribed antibiotics to, if 6% of those happen to be broad spectrum antibiotic, that might not be statistically significant. It might not be abnormal. Why? Because you've got such a small sample size it might not actually be important. You don't need a few people who need it to have it, like a few people that needed to have colmoxiclav because they didn't respond to amoxicillin and they needed anaerobic cover. And suddenly you might hit those numbers. As you get to a larger practice, the data becomes more accurate. These blue lines are the 95% confidence intervals. This dashed line is the mean. So you can see practice D is right in the mean. So big practice would expect it to be near the mean. Okay. So for it to be statistically significant, it's got to be outside of the blue line. Why? Because the blue line are the 95% confidence intervals. Okay. So the only ones that are statistically significantly outside what we'd expect are practice E, which is statistically significantly lower. They're doing really well. Okay. And practice B, which is statistically significantly higher. A is very high, but because such a small practice, it doesn't leave, get to the level of statistical significance. Okay. So that's why the right answer is B. Okay. That it's higher than expected, and it's statistically significantly higher because it's outside of these blue lines. So if we look at how to interpret this graph, along this axis is the patient list size. You can see as this practice gets bigger, 15,000 patient practice, okay, it's gonna be, the data is gonna be more accurate, okay? A small practice, 
can you see a couple of percentage change can happen from just a few patients. And then this is the percentage of broad spectrum antibiotic prescribing. So this is higher percentage, this is lower percentage. Okay, so the blue lines are the 95% confidence interval. You can see it's like having a big study. When you have a big study, you have a narrow 95% confidence interval. That's what's happening. Big practice would expect them to be very close to the mean. Even if they're a bit away from the mean, that will be statistically significant. Okay, because you need a lot of patients to go from 4% to 5% if you've got 15,000 patients. Okay, smaller practices, you need a bigger number of actual patients to change before it becomes statistically significant. Okay? So that's why it's wider here and it becomes narrower here. So this is the mean. Okay, these are the 95% confidence intervals. And then what you've got here are outliers, all right? I, these are outside of what statistically would be expecting. So it's statistically significantly above, statistically significantly below, okay? Right, let's look at an admin topic, accessing medical information is the last question. So I can see that the most popular answer is D, okay? About half of you have picked that, and then every other one's about even, okay? So D, Access to Health uh, Records Act 1990, just under half. All of the others are fairly evenly spread, okay? Um, so the correct answer here is D, Access to Health Records. So about half of you just under have got that right, so well done. But that still means a lot of people struggle with this, and we know this, the admin domain is the one that doctors do worst in, in the AKT, okay? The key thing here is, this patient is not trying to access their own records. If you want to get your own records, you apply either under the Data Protection Act 2018 or GDPR 2018. He wants access to his father's record and his father's recently deceased, and he's uh, considering legal action, he's the next of kin. To do that, you need the Access to Health Records Act 1990. Okay, so D is the right answer. I'll explain these other two ones in a minute. So the important legislation you need to know about in relation to health records, if someone wants to access their own information, they need to put in something called a subject access request, an SAR, under either the Data Protection Act 2018, which is a law in the UK, or the General Data Protection Regulation, which is an EU law, so it won't apply after Brexit is complete. The Access to Medical Reports Act 1988 is used by companies that want to access information about their employees, often to do with occupational health issues if they're sick, for example. If someone wants to access records of a deceased patient, first of all, they need to have a reason why and a connection. So they need to be the next of kin or the legal executor of the will or someone like that. And usually it's because they want to sue the practice or something like that. You know, they, they feel that something's gone wrong. But if they want to do that, they can't use the Data Protection Act because that's only to access your own information. To access someone else's information who's passed away, you need the Access to Health Records Act 1990, which is what this one was. The Computer Misuse Act 1990 is to do with unauthorized access to data on a computer. So, you know, someone illegally accessing confidential information on a computer, okay, they could be prosecuted under the Computer Misuse Act. And then for public authorities like primary care organizations, like health boards or commissioning groups, if a member of the public wanted to get access to information, for example, how much did you pay um, the chief executive of the commissioning group of the health board, they could apply under the Freedom of Information Act 2000, and they would have to give that information because it's publicly funded it's a public authority okay so that's the freedom of information act that can't be used to get information about individual patients okay it's about organizations okay so in terms of those of you that are preparing for the akt just tell you about some of the support that we offer so we've got lots of free support if you're not already a member of the gp training support group or the akt study group um, the team will put links to both of those in, into the group please join that the gp training support group is the largest and most active group on facebook for gp trainees we've got 20,400 plus members people in every year of training, trainers, uh, examiners even are in the group, okay? Um, 
about 30 days before every AKT, I post into the group every day a video with a high yield question and explanation of the current guideline related to it. We'll call it the 30 day challenge. Um, and then during lockdown, I did a lockdown learning webinar. Um, we did nine of them. We did them every week or every other week. The recordings of those and so nine hours worth of CPD is available on our YouTube channel. Um, and then at the beginning of October, usually about just less than a month, about three and a half, four weeks before each exam, I run a high yield revision webinar where like this, but we just do AKT because we're now going to do some things about consultation. We do 15 high yield questions with uh, discussion and teaching. So that will be in October. Again, the link to book that will be in the uh, GP training support group. So do join the group if you're not already a member. And then we've got our, our paid courses. So our clinical case cards uh, are currently sold out. Uh, we first published these in August 2018 six printings have sold out and the latest set were updated in august 2020 so they're bang up to date with the current guidelines so you know they're double-sided um, printed on really good quality card uh, we cover 112 topics between these 56 double-sided cards um, and so <clears throat> if you wanted to get those they're on pre-order at the moment because they're sold out but if you go to our website i'll just show you so in the akt section at the bottom you'll see clinical case cards clinical case cards, okay, for AKT, for CSA, they're the same. So they're discounted, they're normally 36.99, but because they're on pre-order, we won't be able to ship them out till after the weekend, you can get a discount, okay? Um, our main AKT course is running on the 12th of September and on the uh, 26th of September. So those of you thinking of sitting either in October or some people like to come early for thinking about January. So we're running that in Birmingham, in London, uh, the London date is full, but there's also a live stream option available. You can join from home. Uh, it's a full seven hour course covering all three domains, exam technique. We do three teaching mocks during the day and a full 200 question mock afterwards. We have AKT masterclass webinars, just over three hours of intense learning each in the evening. We've got statistics made simple, all the key stats topics, including all of the new style questions in just over three hours. And we go through 45 example questions and worked examples, but more than 60 topics. The organization domain organized all of the key admin topics, again, in just over three hours, um, including more than 45 questions, I think. And then the higher clinical grammar is slightly longer. It's 56 plus questions and about 75. All the topics mentioned by examiners in their examiner reports for the last 10 years are in that uh, higher clinical grammar. These questions come up again and then again and again. OK, so those are all available either on specific dates in October or you can just get instant access to the recorded version. Then we've got our AKT 200 question grammar where we do 450 question teaching mocks, um, making up a full mock by the end of the day. And we review in one day 160 clinical topics and guidelines, 20 stats topics, 20 admin topics. All of the questions in these are different to these and different to these and different to our online. And we've got all of those packaged together with our online revision, which has over 2,150 questions in the AKT Pass Plus bundle. Or our most comprehensive package is our AKT Pass Guarantee Program. So we have that as either a 150-day program or a 90-day program. The 150-day program for January 2021 exam will be starting at the end of this month. And basically, for the first four months, every other day, I'll send you an email with a question of the day, reading to do, and some online questions to do. Um, and you've got until the next email hits to get that done. The last 30 days, every day you're going to get questions. We're going to do a whole load of mocks. We gather data from you for the first 60 days. So that the last 30 days, everyone gets their own individual revision plan. Anyway, right, let's do some home visiting tips and then we're going to do a practice case and then we're going to do FAQs. So we're going to do five tips for home visits. Those of you that have asked questions, don't worry, I'm going to come back to the questions at the end. Okay, um, questions will be answered at the end. Okay. So five tips for you know successful home visits. So, Number one, triage. Number two, check www, not the World Wide Web. Number three, safety. Number four, equipment. And number five, documentation. I'm going to just expand each of these in a bit more details. OK, so number one, triage. One of the things that I always do is if someone else has triaged this patient to needing a home visit, I will read their details of their entry, who it was. OK, and then I will consider would I like to call ahead myself? And sometimes I'll call ahead and I'll retry on and someone that someone else felt needed a visit, I might feel doesn't need a visit. Now, as a trainee, you might not feel confident doing that. And if you're in any doubt, go out, go and do the visit. OK, that's part of your learning that once you've done enough and you've done hundreds and hundreds, you'll be more confident in the ones that you say, look, this doesn't need a visit. This can be managed by asking them to come in or it can be managed remotely or over the telephone or a video call or something like that. OK. I always find it helpful that even if someone else is triaged and I trust them and I'm happy to go out, that I still call ahead just to find out since they triaged them, 
They might have tried them in the morning and I'm doing the visit in the evening. Maybe something's changed and they've become suddenly drastically worse. And actually, I might need to call an ambulance because me going there is going to add delay and cause more harm. You know, I'm trying to think what's in the best interest of the patients. Sometimes between them being tried in the morning and me finishing my clinic in the morning and going out to do the visit, if I call them, maybe something's changed. Maybe they got so bad they went to a &E. Maybe they've started improving because they tried taking some painkillers or something and actually a visit might not be necessary anymore. You see, so it's worth just thinking about triage, okay? Number two, check www. So you've decided you're gonna go and do this visit. First thing to check is exactly who is this visit for? How old are the patient? I wanna get an idea, is it a young child? Is it someone elderly? You know, I wanna look in their notes. I wanna look at, um, are they already known to the palliative care team? Are there other services that are in, already involved that we might need to contact? But also I want to find out who else is at home? Who called the visit in? Is there someone that's gonna be there that'll be able to maybe feedback some of the information I give them in terms of medication to help with compliance, to go and pick up a prescription for them? Because if they're too unwell to come and visit you, if I go there and I give a prescription, they might be too unwell to go and get that. So I'm, I'm trying to think ahead, okay? Then I want to look up where, okay? Exactly where is the visit? For example, are they shielding and they're actually not in their normal address? They're staying with their uh, son or daughter. Uh, if they're at their normal address, what's the parking like? Is there somewhere where I'm going to have to park further away? Have they got any pets? You know, if they've got a, a pit bull, I might ask that they make sure that the dog is locked away in a different room before I arrive there, okay? You know, I want to know about these things, all right? What? Is the last w you know what are the main issues that they're asking for a visit request for so by my triage and the notes i'm going to read i'm going to get an idea about that and by reading the notes i'm going to get as much background but then we're going to start planning ahead okay what are the possible outcomes what are the possible differentials for example if it sounds like it might be someone that might need an admission i'm going to make sure that i've got as much detail pre-printed so that maybe i can add a small note and i've already got printed their usual drugs and things like that rather than having to write all of that out um you know in every case, I'm going to make sure that I've got available a prescription pad because I might need to write a prescription. Sometimes I might need to just double check have I got the right uh, drugs and we'll talk about that in a second. OK, so yeah, I want to get as much preparation before I leave as possible. Number three, think about safety. So is my phone <clears throat> fully charged? Because if I get stuck, I might need to call someone at the home, either the person that called you know, the, or a family member to get specific directions because there are some places that if you've done home visits, you'll know it's really frustrating. Some houses don't have numbers, they have names. Okay, and so the sat nav doesn't pick it up. Or some roads, they just really numbered weird way. It jumps from one to suddenly there's six. On the, in, in, you know, in some roads, you've got all the even numbers on one side, all the odd ones on one side, until you get one part and then it goes. The road I live on, as you come into it, Half of the numbers split off one way, half of the numbers split off another way. A lot of houses you'll see, there's number 12, there's no number 13 because people are suspicious, uh, sorry, superstitious. So they don't like to number their house number 13, so it jumps to number 14. You know, things like that, you want to just make sure your phone is charged so you can get directions. But also, remember, you're in training for a reason. You're not ready for fully independent practice yet. And part of being safe is that you want to have your phone charged so that if you're stuck and you want to get a second opinion, you want to talk to your trainer, you can get advice. Or if you get in a difficult situation and you want to call for help, or sometimes you get to a situation and you need the police to come and assist you. You think someone might need a police section. Again, you want to be able to call for help. Okay. Make sure you think about your own safety. Is the team aware where you're going? Is your trainer available for you to call them? You know, have you got their mobile number, for example, because they might be going out on another visit themselves. They might not be in their consulting room and when to expect you to return so that if there's a big delay, maybe they can call you just for safety, especially in the winter. You know, when it's dark, you've got to think about your personal safety. When you get there, assess your safety again on arrival. You know, I've heard of some heavy situations where sometimes a patient is maybe, you know, someone who might need to be sectioned, they're psychotic or really unwell from the mental health perspective. But if they're there saying that if you come in, I'm going to stab you and they've got a knife, you've got to think about, is it safe for you to go in? You've got to think about your safety. And sometimes you need to call the police and get them to assist you, for example. Okay. Think about the safety of your car. Make sure it's locked. Don't leave things visible. Any paraphernalia that might make you identifiable as a doctor might make it a target because people might think you might have medication there. We might have something valuable that they could steal. You know, I know of people who have had uh, cars broken into, windows smashed, and things taken that were left in the you know back seat visible. Okay, so you want to think about these things. Number four, equipment. Before you go out, 
check that your bag has got everything. So, you know, have you got all of the equipment that you're going to need? Have you got your diagnostic, your ophthalmoscope, your otoscope? You know, uh, have you got a thermometer? Have you got um, batteries for your ophthalmoscope? Are they fully charged if it's not one of those that uses reusable batteries? Have you got your SFIG? You know, have you got a pulse oximeter? Have you got emergency drugs? So, you know, if, for example, you need to give someone benzoyl penicillin, is it in date? Have you got a prescription pad? Have you got letterhead in case you need to admit someone? Okay. And number five, documentation. Take a summary printout with you. So that at least you've got, you know, the patient's base details. You've got their medication. If you then need to convert this patient into being admitted, because remember, who needs home visits? Often people are more sick. OK, so I always found that helpful. Then I could just write a brief letter on letterhead and say, you know, the main details are here. And then just my main findings on examination and what I was hoping that they would do. But I wouldn't need to write out, for example, all of their past medical history and their drugs. That's just attached. And I could put that in an envelope and give it to them or a family member to take. them. OK, and then you want to document as much as possible in detail there and then go back to the practice and add it to the electronic record as soon as possible. And another thing about documentation, just practical about money. Remember that when you do home visits, you can claim business mileage, okay? And that you need to have business cover for your car. Having a standard commuting policy, SDP, social domestic pleasure and commuting, will not cover you for home visits. If you don't have business use cover and you do a home visit and you get in a crash, you will get points on your license and you could get prosecuted for driving without valid insurance, okay, and get fined. On top of that, they won't pay out any claim because your insurance is invalidated because you were using it for the business but you didn't have business use cover. So make sure you've got that and then log all the miles so that you can claim your miles and your deanery will have its own policy. But in some deaneries, for example, if you don't claim within 30 days, they won't let you claim at all. So make sure you're claiming because over a year it can add up to hundreds of pounds claiming your business mileage. OK, so that's some tips to make you, you know, maximize your safety and how you can get the most out of home visits. It's a really important learning experience during training to do home visits. Okay. Right. I want to do a practice case now, and then I'm going to do a few frequently asked questions, take questions, uh, and then we should be able to finish at 9.30. So here's the background. Have a look at this patient. Okay. Everyone had a look at that? So I'll be the patient. Okay. Let me open. Okay. The chat's open. Good. So please ask your questions in the chat, not in the Q&A. Okay. So into the chat. Please, let's make a start. Okay, let's imagine that those of you that joined last week, we talked about, you know, checking the patient if you're doing a remote consultation. This actually is a patient that has come in. So I'm in the room with you. So you don't need to do all of that. Okay, so I've introduced myself. You've introduced yourself. Let's make a start. Okay, someone ask a question. Okay, um, someone says, hello, James, how can I help you? Uh, doctor, it's, um, I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed about this, but um, essentially I want the snip. Yeah, I want the SNP. So can you help me with that? So several people have asked, how can I help you? That's the first answer. Okay, so they want the SNP, right? So I'm, I've already turned up in practice. So, okay, someone said, feel free to talk more. Well, what do you mean, doctor? When you say feel free to talk more, I mean, I just want the SNP, doc. You know, I, I'm fed up with it all. And, um, I, I, you know, I don't want any more. I just want the SNP. Someone said, what do you mean by the SNP? Well, look, we've just had our third. We're outnumbered now. And, uh, you know, I can't cope with this. I, I can't even fathom how we're going to afford the three we've got. I'm getting no sleep. I'm struggling with work. If we had a fourth one, it'd be a disaster. I think our relationship would break down. So I just I don't want any accidents. You know, I don't want a repeat of what happened last time. I just want to make sure that I can't get my wife pregnant again. So I want to snip. Someone's asked a good question. Is this a decision you've been thinking about for a long time? I wouldn't say it's a long time. Um, I'd say probably since the third one came along or maybe before the third one came along. I think once my wife was in the third trimester of her pregnancy, I think I started thinking about this. That did we want to go through this again? Someone's asked a really good question. What happened last time? What happened last time? I tell you, she was on the coil. And so obviously I thought that's good. You're on the coil. You're safe can't get pregnant, therefore we don't need any additional prote protection, she still managed to get pregnant, even though she's on the call. So only afterwards, we read the small print, they said, actually, while it's rare, it can happen. There is a small chance, and it's typical of my luck, that if it's going to happen to someone, it's going to happen to me. And that's what happened. Have you discussed this with your partner? Right now, she's busy with the baby. You know, the baby's only two months old. Um, so I, 
I, I don't really want to bother her about it. That she was taking responsibility of this, do you see? And I thought it was taken care of, but obviously it wasn't. So now I want to take responsibility so it doesn't happen again. Someone's asked, what do you know about the SNP? To be honest, I really don't know much about it. I just know that if it's done, you know, then it'd be safe to have sex without worrying about pregnancy. And that, that's all I want. Someone said, um, how am I affected in terms of work? Well, it's just, you know, like with the baby, the baby doesn't really sleep in the night. So then I wake up really tired. Uh, Mrs. at home with the three kids. You know, what with COVID and everything, they've not been at school. So she's got a handful with the baby and the two older ones. But I've still got to go to work. Um, and so, but I'm tired. So I'm finding that I'm so tired because I've not slept through the night. By the afternoon, I'm sort of falling asleep on the job. And then, you know, obviously the boss isn't very happy about that. Um, it's not that safe, is it? So I've got to think about, if we had another one, go through all of this again, but also it's costs as well, isn't it? You know, um, so like you don't get much child benefit after the first one. We're already struggling. Um, I was on furlough for a couple of months. Now they got me back, but my pay's been cut because I'm not getting any overtime. So someone's asked, what about my mood? Well, I mean, I think everyone's a bit fed up with all of this lockdown. Um, I'm tired. I think when you're tired, you get a bit cranky, don't you? Um, I, I think sometimes I have been a bit snappy with my wife. Uh, I've noticed that, but I wouldn't say I'm I'm down or anything. I'm just tired and fed up. Someone said, "Is it possible you might consider other non-permanent measures? Like what, doctor? Are there other things that I could have? What other things could I have? Because I said I want to take responsibility because my my missus has been doing this, and you know she's doing her best, but clearly it didn't work. I just don't want that to happen again. And you know, like condoms are hit and miss." because sometimes you might not have one. They're not foolproof. I, I want something that's gonna work. Someone's asked, does your wife use any contraception? Well, as I said, she was on the coil. She's obviously, once she found out she was pregnant, we had that out um, and she's not anything now, but she's breastfeeding. So I just, I want to be responsible for it myself. So can you tell me a bit more about the actual procedure? Someone's asked any shortness of breath. No, I'm not short of breath, doc. I'm, why are you asking that? That's a strange question. I, I'm here to get a snip. Okay, great, thank you very much. I'll stop you guys there. Okay, so some really good questions. You guys are really thinking about not just the actual procedure, but you know, what's their mindset, the social aspects, what do they know about it, um, you know, and, and other things, that's really great. Okay, so uh, let's move it forward. I'll ask you a few more questions in a minute. So yeah, things that you want to ask, you know, what's a current relationship like, why? Because if someone's going through a trouble patch in their relationship, it's not an ideal time to be thinking about something that's permanent, okay? Is the partner aware? That's a really important question. I'm glad that people asked about that early on. Have they got any children already and how many? And when was the most recent one? That's another one that, you know, when you've got a newborn, often uh, we've got a newborn. You might hear my baby crying. And he's just turned three months. Actually, I'm not thinking of the snip, but uh, I, you know, I, I can think about how this patient might feel in terms of not getting much sleep and all of the rest. OK, uh, so, you know, ask about those things. So any recent stress like, you know, a recent birth? Any history of miscarriage in the past? You know, were there any terminations in the past? Um, issues in the family? Any relationship crises? Okay. Understanding of their procedure. What do they know about this? You know, what's their understanding of it? But also clarifying what do they mean by the SNP? They might mean different things, right? Okay. So it's good that people sort of, you know, try to clarify that. Okay. So can you think of some very specific questions that you should ask so that you can rule out? risks for later regret because you have to consider that vasectomy is a permanent procedure while it is possible sometimes to reverse it not on the nhs that's not always possible and so we have to consider it when they have it done we need to counsel them they should consider it irreversible so there's some questions that are very specific that you should ask so that you reduce the risk of regret later okay in the guidance this is mentioned so anyone think of any specific questions that you might want to ask this patient to try and rule some of those things out Okay, is your family complete? Okay, um, whether or not, you know, you feel that you or the partner would like to have more children in the past. Do they understand that it's permanent? Have they thought about if this marriage ended and they wanted to remarry and might they want children with a, a, another partner? Okay. Um, are they in a stable relationship? If they're aware of the fact that it's considered permanent and irreversible, or that the possible side effects. Great, so again, asking some really, really good questions. Okay, this is excellent. So in 
the exam setting, let's say you're doing the recorded consultation assessment or CSA, some of you early on, you're in ST1 or ST2, you know, by the time you used to it, it's probably going to go back to CSA, but those of you in ST3, you're going to be doing the RCA. It's a good example where, you know, if you can look up the guidance beforehand, then you can ask it in a very concise way so that you can get it done in the time. So these are the specific questions that you want to ask because these are what are known as the risk for uh, later regret uh, issues okay that you want to identify so if they're younger than 30 years there's research that they're much more likely to later regret that they now can't have children okay if they've not had any children if they take the decisions during the pregnancy or very soon after the birth okay if they take decisions in reaction to the end of a relationship because at that point people might be very down very upset very angry but in a new relationship they might completely change their mindset and want to start a family if there's any possibility that there might be a risk of coercion by the partner being pressured, you know, by family members or health or social welfare professionals, any of these things that are there, then, you know, they need really good counselling before you consider that they might actually have this procedure. So in terms of data gathering, one of the things you want to do after you've found out why they want it and sort of, you know, the details of how it's impacting them, um, if they've talked to their partner, ruled out the risk for later regret. These are some of the things you want to do. You want to assess how much do they understand and know about the procedure? Do they understand how it's performed? Do they understand that it's considered irreversible? And that even if they try to reverse it, it which might not be possible, that that wouldn't be on the NHS. And you know, privately, it's unlikely that it would be successful. And are they aware of the alternative? So for example, you know, a few people had mentioned, for example, his wife, if the coil hadn't worked, the other things they could consider. The, you know, implant, um, you know, long-acting reversible contraception options, th things like that, okay? Now, do we need to do any examination? So the patient's here. Is there anything we'd like to examine? If so, what are they? Okay, yeah, so absolutely. What we need to do, the main thing is to examine the scrotum to see if they might have a varicocele or a hydrocele because these things, if they're there, we might want to try to, you know, um, treat them first because it's going to make the, uh, any operation more difficult, okay? Um, a couple of other people have said more basic things like cardiovascular blood pressure, things like that aren't really that relevant. And one of the things you want to do is, you know, if you've got 10 minutes, especially if you're recording a consultation to present, doing things that aren't relevant to that particular consultation are going to take up valuable time. Remember, your timer still runs while you're doing, uh, if you're doing a blood pressure, you're going to lose a couple of minutes, okay? It's not particularly relevant. They're not acutely unwell. You know, it's not going to make a difference to whether or not they can have the operation, okay? Of course, they're going to have pre-op and get all of those things done at that time anyway. Do you see? It's more things that might make a difference in, to management now, okay? Um, and in terms of management, so, you know, we want to discuss some of the risks and people have already put some of these in there. So, you know, a risk of hematoma, a small risk of infection, somewhere between 1% and 14%, between, depending on which study and who's doing it, uh, there's this risk of chronic post-vasectomy pain, which can be really, really difficult to deal with and can cause sexual dysfunction, okay? There's a lifetime failure rate of about 1 in 2,000, and it's considered irreversible on the NHS. In terms of follow-up, ideally, we'd want to see them again with their partner, especially if there's any uncertainty and they hadn't discussed it with their partner, or if they had any of those risks for later regret, we'd want to make sure we'd seen both people and ideally together, okay? If they've got none of those risks and they're very confident they want it, just refer them, okay? And then advise them that after they've had it done, they need to have semen analysis at least 12 weeks post-stop. And ideally, you want two samples that are, you know, showing that there's no sperm or non active sperm before you say, okay, you're definitely safe now to not have to use condoms. And even beyond that, you might still think about condoms to reduce risk of STI. Okay, good. And in terms of interpersonal, how might you explain the procedure? Feel free to have a quick go, like in 30 seconds, if you want to just type it into the chat or someone wants to just think about how you might say, how might you explain what actually happens in a vasectomy? Okay, and I'll show you in 30 seconds, how am I explaining? Okay, and a few people have mentioned it might be worth showing them a website, a leaflet, so they can read about it, then come back having discussed it maybe with their wife, and then maybe, you know, you, you take the referral onwards from there. Okay, you also need to be sensitive in asking about and exploring whether or not there might be pressure from someone else. You need to be very sensitive about how you explore some of these questions. Okay, so how might you explain the actual procedure? Okay, so let me show you one of the things I find really helpful is a good example where I'd pull up a picture or sometimes I'd draw a little picture myself because sometimes a pictures are worth a thousand words, right? Okay, and it can make it much easier to explain. Okay, so look, this is something that's typically done as a day case. So you'll go in the morning, you know, it can be done with a local anesthetic or essentially they're going to make a very small cut in your scrotum, a 
and I'd show them a picture like this, okay? And you've got a tube that connects your testicles, okay, um, to your penis, and, you know, sperm will come out of there, okay, uh, during ejaculation. What they'll do is they'll make a very small cut in the scrotum. They will then make two cuts, and sometimes they'll actually remove a section of the tube that connects the testes to the penis. After that, they seal both ends. So usually they'll cauterize it. So that's using something really hot to seal it. And then often they'll also then just do a little suture, a little stitch on each side. And then essentially this is closed, this is closed, sperm can't travel in between. And so that's why you couldn't end up making your wife pregnant, okay? Um, so, you know, that's a simple way to explain the actual procedure. But often I'd find drawing just a picture to show the testes, the tube connecting to the penis, that can make it really clear to understand that we're gonna snip here, snip here, and then it'll be sealed off, okay? Right, now this actually is one of 100 cases I've adapted a little bit so that you know it works for this, taken from our CSA 100 case crammer, okay? So essentially, this was a full day course. We're not running the actual course live at the moment, but we've got a recording of the last course. Um, so it's about eight, nearly eight hours worth of video on there. There's 100 cases for each one. We discuss what are the key things to ask? What are the red flags not to miss? What are the relevant examinations? What are the current guidelines for management, okay? And then how would you explain it clearly? And of the 100 cases, 20 of them are interactive cases where there's a simulator and you actually think about what questions you ask and the stuff gets revealed little bit by little. And it comes with a PDF course booklet, which is 284 pages, over 500 slides, okay? Um, and it is possible some people like to actually either print that themselves or they like to buy the printed version of that. And it's really useful if you are going to do your first ever GP rotation and you just want to learn how things present and what kinds of questions you should be thinking about and what the current guidelines are. Some people find it useful for doing that. Uh, the other thing that it can be really useful for is if you're going to be recording the recorded consultation assessment to actually look at things like that. You can then have this in front of you. You know, you, you call up your patient. You know that they're going to come to talk about this. You've looked up all the guidelines you've got in front of you. You can actually have if you're doing a telephone consult. You could have in front of you a checklist of you know, things to ask so that you rule out those risks for regret later. You know the current guidelines, you know how to explain it. It's all in front of you, okay? So that's the CSA 100 case grammar and the team will put the link for it together. And those of you preparing for the RCA, our next RCA intensive course is on the 17th September. So before you come to the course, you get four hours of video recording of our RCA masterclass on how to prepare, how to record technical things. Uh, you get our two hour CSA pre-course learning, which covers consultation skills, breaking bad news, how to structure consultation, how things are marked. Then on the day, it's all about practice. So we run it on Zoom. We only take nine registrars. There'll be two simulators, a male and female simulator. There's two trainers, so myself and one other, okay? And throughout the day, we'll go through 25 cases with simulators. So the day is all about practice. Then after the course, we give you 65 more cases with detailed mark schemes to practice further, but also some people have used that as a template again when they're recording certain consultations, okay? So that's our RCA preparation course. The next one is on the 17th of September, okay? And then the RCA masterclass, some people just want the masterclass, they don't want the practice. The masterclass is a four hour recording of a half day RCA masterclass, so that's available. But if you book this course, you get the recording of the masterclass as part of it, okay? Right, I just wanna talk about frequently asked questions for about five minutes, and then I'll stay back and answer any questions that people have got, okay? So I often get asked questions about these things, about leave, about additional qualifications, about exposure to other specialties, and about when to sit the AKT and the CSA or RCA. I also get asked lots of questions about workplace-based assessment, but the reason I'm not covering that today is in the last month's uh, webinar, we covered the new requirements for workplace-based assessment in detail, and you can just watch the video of that on our YouTube channel rather than me go through it all again. Okay, so this is a really common question I get asked from people, especially when they're starting training, is how much annual leave and how much study leave am I entitled to? So annual leave is based on years of NHS service. When you've got less than five years of NHS service, you get 27 days of annual leave plus public holidays. So there's like eight bank holidays or public holidays, okay? Once you've got five years or more, now some of you will never get five years service until you finish training. Like if you did F1, F2, three years of training, you don't hit five years until you qualify. Okay, so then you'll have 27 year, days throughout the whole of training. But let's say someone had already done a couple of years of training in something else after foundation, before they came into GP. You can see towards the end of their training, they might hit five years service. So then you get an extra week's annual leave. You get 32 days plus public holidays. Now, sometimes you go into a practice and unless you specifically ask for it and you know that you're entitled to that, they'll just put you on a standard contract because most trainees only get 27 days. So you need to know that you're entitled to the extra five days and ask for it. 
Okay, and then study leave is 30 days per year. However, time from that gets taken off for things like your regional training, your VTS training, your half day training that you go to. Uh, sometimes there'll be like mandatory training, induction, things like that. So typically most people get about 10 days per year of usable annual leave. Okay, private study leave is discretionary. So that's something you need to understand that it's not a right in the contract. So study leave is to use to go on courses, to go on conferences. If you want to stay at home and revise, that's called private study leave. There's no automatic right to that. You can ask your trainer, you can ask your trust, and they might let you, but they might not. Okay. Um, but, you know, if you want to go on a course, let's say you're in the hospital and you're doing psych, but you want to go on a course to do with dermatology because you're interested in that and you don't have a derm job. That's okay. They should approve it as long as it's relevant to your training as a GP overall. It doesn't have to be relevant to that job. Okay. Similarly, someone had asked, um, can they claim our courses from study budget? So each team we deals with their own procedures for how they authorize and how you claim study budget. But pretty much all of our courses have been claimed by people from some deaneries. So all I would say is ask, you know, um, you know some deaneries, they'll say they'll only, you know, allow certain courses and only a course that they're not already running in their deanery will be allowed if it's from an external provider okay whereas other deaneries like health education east of england they directly commission us to run our akt course for all of their trainees okay they, they can book it directly with us or others like just this week i've been asked to run a course for bedford and luton vts trainee uh, at the beginning of october so you know the deanery is going to part fund that essentially okay that the vts scheme um, so ask your deanery for their procedure and whether or not they'll approve a specific course okay Another question I get asked is, is it worth doing additional qualifications during training? The answer to that is it depends on you, your career goals, what do you want to do when you finish training? What are your interests? What are your rotations? So things that are good reasons to do additional qualifications. Sometimes it can help plug gaps in knowledge. I'll give an example. If you've got no women's health rotation, you might do something like the DRCOG as a way to get the knowledge base about women's health relevant to GP and a way to make you learn these things. Okay. Let's say that you've got... Uh, I don't know, no psych, you might go to a workshop on psychiatry to get that exposure, okay? Sometimes, if you're really interested in something, you're interested in minor surgery, you could do a minor surgical skills course so that you can gain that skill to help you develop that later on after qualification as an interest. In some cases, it can motivate learning. Some of you might just read things that you don't have rotations. Others, if there's not an exam to sit, you might not do that reading. And so it can be just a motivation to do the uh, reading. Something really important though, you need to be realistic. Okay, what you don't want to do is do something optional. Training's already hard. MRCGP is already hard. What you don't want to do is take on something unrealistic. A good example, some people try to do the Masters in Dermatology from Cardiff University. Fantastic course, but that needs about 20 hours of study every week for two years if you're doing it part time. Otherwise, it's more or less full time. If you try to do something like that while you're also trying to do training and you've got your e-portfolio and your learning logs and you've got to get all of your other assessments signed off and AKT and CC, the risk is that you end up failing membership you're trying to do something extra. That's something to do after training. It's too much to take on. I did a master's in informatics. The workload was huge. Okay. If I tried to do that while I was also trying to do my GP training, the risk is I end up failing both. You don't want to do that, okay? Whereas there are short courses and there are qualifications that don't need as much study, like DRCOG, okay? Um, you know, that's manageable, like DFSRH, like uh, Diploma of Child Health, that might be manageable, okay? Or short courses, or courses that don't give, uh, you know, long courses of study, but they're like one or two day courses and give a certification. Like in training, I did the drug misuse certificate. And that's really useful because I work in community detox now and I've worked as a prison GP for many years, okay? Whatever you do, don't, pursue any additional qualifications for the letters because by and large when you're qualified no one's interested in your other letters or for the money why because most additional qualifications won't earn you any more money when you qualify so you want to do it because either it's going to help you be a better gp it's going to help you be more confident be more knowledgeable and be better able to deal with your patients or because it's going to motivate you to learn you're interested in it okay another common question i get i didn't get a rotation in derm in ent in eyes, in women's health, in peds, in psych. But of course, I'm seeing lots of patients with mental health problems. I'm seeing lots of patients with skin conditions. You know, I didn't get the rotations I wanted. How can I get exposure to them? The answer is you've got to be really proactive and you've got to look after your, your own learning. So you could do things like do an e-learning course 
you could pursue a qualification that we just talked about. When you're in the GP training part, the GP rotations in your training, you get one half day every week for self-directed learning. That does, isn't time off to sit at home. That's time you could use to arrange to go to clinics, go and sit in dermatology clinic one afternoon a week for six weeks, arrange it with a consultant, get it approved by your trainer, go and sit in a women's health clinic and you know, uh, for six weeks, go and sit in palliative care in a hospice for six weeks and so on, okay? You know, half days, you could use that. And then you could go on courses. You can go on specialty specific workshops or courses that you could find. RCGP run some, you might find some run by local CPD groups in your area. Um, and then we run, because a lot of people struggle with this exact problem um, and finding, you know, specific workshops. We've been running the National GP Training Conference since 2019. So we ran one this year in uh, uh, just before lockdown in March. We ran it in September 2019. We're planning 2021 now. Hopefully lockdown will be over by then. So um, essentially what we do is we have keynotes that everyone attends. And then you can go to specific specialty workshops or career workshops. So we've had workshops on ENT, um, ophthalmology. Sorry, we didn't have ENT. We're going, oh yeah, we had ENT this last year. We had ophthalmology uh, the year before. We had dermatology both years. We had women's health both years. We had psychiatry in the first one. Um, I ran workshops on AKT and CSA. I ran one on different career options, okay? So the video recording of the 2020 course is available. So we had Dr. Sweetenham, who's a, a, a GP partner and a GP with special interest on um, ENT. He did a talk about becoming a GP with special interest, but then he also did an ENT workshop, including how to assess ENT conditions, how to do things like the EPLI. Um, I did AKT and CSA workshops, and uh, I did a careers workshop. Dr. Nigga Arif is a GP with specialist interest in women's health and a portfolio GP. She works as a private GP. She's the BBC's resident GP. You might see her on the couch. She's on there uh, nearly every week. Uh, so she did a women's health workshop. Dr. Avad Mughal, I went to medical school with. He's a consultant dermatologist, and he did the 10 most common skin conditions that we see in primary care, how to assess them, lots of case examples, pictures, in you know, how to take a good history, how to differentiate the ones that need to be referred, the ones that don't need to be referred, how to treat them, okay? Um, and then Dr. Arif also talked about portfolio careers and how she got involved in all of these different things, right? And I did a keynote on how to succeed as a GP and the habits of a successful GP trainee, okay? So it's over eight and a half hours of learning between all of these workshops. Again, it's on our website. Someone will post a link for you in a minute. Um, it's live.gptraining.info. You can subscribe anywhere from a month to 12 months, okay? And have access to all of those. Another question I get asked is, when should I sit the AKT? The answer is when you're ready, <laughs> okay? When you're gonna pass. So you can sit this, remember, in ST2 or ST3. You can't sit it in ST1, but you've got to ask yourself, when can you prepare? Some doctors, they want to sit it the very earliest opportunity in ST2, but for some people, that's not a good time. Why? Because if you've got a really busy rotation, it might not be conducive to study. Like if you're doing A&E or PEDS during that time, that might not be a good time for you to be able to put the hours into study. Why? Because it's a really hard exam. If we look at the last two and a half years, one in three people have been failing each sitting. The pass rates dropped to 67% the last two and a half years, okay? So the absolute minimum time to prepare is three months. If you've got a busy job or you've got a busy life outside of medicine, you know, maybe you've got young kids like me or, you know, you carer for someone else or you've got other things that you need to have responsibilities for maybe four to six months might be better to allow you to cover the curriculum to give you an idea in terms of hours of study it's going to take you at least 200 hours of study time to cover the curriculum once and do a couple of mocks and remember you need to prepare for not just clinical but also admin and stats okay and exam techniques really really important you can have the knowledge but if you don't have good exam technique ultimately you can still lose marks here and then and fail and as i mentioned our Pass Guarantee Program is our most structured program. It's 220 hours of learning, includes two full day courses, nine webinars, okay? Um, three of those are the three plus hour webinars, and then the others are sort of one hour high yield revision webinars that we do. It includes uh, reading, we have a 90 day program and a 150 day program. In the 90 day program, every single day, I send you an email with a question to do some reading. In the 150 day program, the first four months is every other day. So you've got two days to get the work done. The last 30 days is every single day. Um, and then it also includes three full mock exams, over 300 questions, uh, 3,000 questions uh, that are uh, unique, e-medical questions between the courses and our online revision. But then we also give you a uh, question from the RCGP self-test. So you get used to a different bank. And then we will collect data the first 60 days. So the last 30 days, everyone gets their own unique revision plan. It's tailored to your weaknesses. We'll make you do more 
of the things that you don't do well at, even if you don't like it, because people avoid what they don't like. And then it's called the Pass Guarantee Program. Why? As long as you do all the reading on time, attend everything, all nine webinars, both full day courses, do all the revision, read all the cards, do everything we send you on time, we guarantee you'll pass. If you don't, you've got two choices. You either join the next program until you pass, or you can ask for every penny back. We wouldn't even keep an admin fee, okay? As long as you've done all the work. If you join the program and you don't do the work and then you fail, you won't get anything back. Why? Because it's like joining the gym and you never go. I've got a membership, but I've never been. I'm hoping to put on muscle and lose weight. It's not gonna work, is it, okay? The reason we can give this, it's unique. It's because of the amount of work that we've put into this 220 hours worth of guided learning. We know we're going to take away the three most common reasons that people fail AKT. One is they don't allow enough time. So we've made sure that you've got a good amount of hours of learning. Two, they often miss parts of the curriculum. We'll systematically cover all the important topics in the curriculum. And three, people have poor exam technique and confidence in stats and admin. We'll make sure you do really well in stats and admin and that we build up your exam technique and stamina by the end of the, the program, such that we're really confident to, to, you know, to give that back. Okay. The January 2021 program starts the 30th of August for 150 days, or the 90 day program will start in October. Okay. Um, another question, when should I sit the RCA or the CSA? Same answer as AKT, sit it when you're ready. Remember, you can only sit this in ST3, but you've got to think, when will you be ready? Don't rush again, it's an expensive exam and it's a hard exam. The standard that they're assessing for you to pass RCA or CSA is not, is this good for a registrar with six months left or nine months left or three months left? It's is this good enough for a fully qualified GP to practice independently without a supervisor and to be safe? I, if you were a salaried GP or a partner and you were the only doctor in the building, would I be happy that this is a safe history, a safe examination, because you have to physically examine, that you can manage things according to current guidelines and that you can communicate it well and manage it all in 10 minutes? Very few people can do that early on in ST3. So you, know, you want to sit it when you're confident and you're ready, because you need to have great knowledge of how to manage things. You need to consolidate your knowledge of you know what questions to ask the red flags how things present you're being tested not just on your communication skills but also on your clinical skills and time management can you do it in 10 minutes okay and as i said at the moment you know we're running our rca course uh, through zoom but it's still with simulators okay so we still have male and female simulators very experienced and then you know very very high ratio of uh, trainers and faculty so we've got you know two simulators two trainers for only nine registrars. So that means everyone gets individual feedback, okay? A good time to come to that is a, at least a few months before you plan to submit, okay? So any questions now, put them into the Q&A and I'll go through them in the order. Please do join the GP Training Support Facebook group for further updates. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch this video when it's ready and previous videos. Complete feedback, I'll, I'll send you an email asking for feedback in about half an hour after I finish. It's anonymous, so you can be brutally honest, but I wanna know what you'd like covered next month and the month after. And you can register for next month as well. There'll be a link in the email that I send you for feedback. The next one's Thursday the 24th September, same time, 8.30 to 9.30. Apologies that I've run a little bit over. I hope you found it helpful. Please do let me know in the feedback, okay? And you can let me know in the chat now before you head off as well, you know, how you found it, if it's been useful, um, if you'd like me to carry on doing these every month because to prepare an hour's new learning it's taken me all, nearly all of today so and then i'll need to process the videos tomorrow so it's it's significant investment of time so if people are finding it helpful i'm happy to do it but you know if you're not finding it helpful let me know because that also is um something we want to know okay okay so thank you very much everyone for those of you leaving keep going keep pushing remember like anything in life in gp training prepare and you will succeed okay thank you so much have a great evening